Well, so this is the server. So is this something we can access later? Like yes. I wanted to show, so we can always pull it back up and show. It. All right. Hello, my name is Merrick Green, uh, founder and manager partner of the law firm General Counsel PC. Uh, thank you for being here today to see COVID nineteen vaccine mandates for federal contractors uh, presented by General Counsel Sohari Insurance and Rubino. Uh, before we do quick introductions, one I want to say this was. Uh, something that we're doing on behalf of our vet working organization, which is an organization that General Counsel founded a number of years ago. Uh, we actually have the trademark, if anyone's interested. And it's a uh, networking for veterans and something that Craig's gonna really be working with to uh, keep going into the future. Uh, so thank you to our vets. I know we have a number of vets here today, uh, with Veterans Day coming up uh, on Thursday. And I was also told that tomorrow is the uh, Marine Corps birthday. Yes, sir. So happy birthday, hoorah. So with that, um, just a quick introduction. My name is Merrick Green. I'm founder and managing partner of the law firm General Counsel, uh, which we started about 17 years ago. Full service law firm uh, representing businesses, business owners, uh, in addition to our employment law, business, job and litigation. We also do estate planning and family law. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass this to Craig. And then, Alan, you want to introduce yourself, and then Craig can take over. Yeah, I'm Alan Hudson. I'm the director of the Property and Casualty Division at Sahori Insurance. We are an all lines brokerage here in Tyson's. I've been doing this for 52 years in counting. Uh, we started as Great Falls Insurance Agency, and now we are a group of one, say 60 or 70. Uh, it's hard to count when we're all working remotely. Uh, we, we specialize in, in particular verticals on the Side. So, government contractors, real estate, and uh, technology, some more specializations. Can I introduce myself too? Please. Okay. Uh, Patrick Curtis, I'm with Rubino Company. I'm a partner in the firm. Uh, the firm's been around since about 1980, so 40, 41 years in the business. I've been with the firm for about 20. Uh, we have several verticals, uh, nonprofits, government contractors, which is kind of particular to this particular event, um, and affordable housing and, and sort of related industries. Uh, Craig Wallace, I'm the senior counsel for uh, General Counsel PC uh, for the government contracts area of practice. Uh, fairly new on board, uh, but I'm going to be walking you through these uh, slides as, a, as an uptick. I did want to take a quick second to underscore that the vet working uh, that we just talked about, that Merrick uh, talked about, was something that uh, the three sponsors are very engaged in. Um, it gives us a chance in this area to be able to do outreach for a very important part of the community. Um, this eve before Veterans Day, uh, there are quite a few veterans here that have been mentors, uh, both up and down uh, for me over the time. So I really appreciate that time. But we really want to be able to talk right now about the COVID-19 uh, vaccine mandates for federal contractors, which I think everybody in the room uh, actually has an interest issue in as well. Um, you're free to answer questions. Uh, we're going to go through this fairly succinctly. We do have some time at the end of this. If you want to hold them, that's fine. Just, you, you have a, 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 a pad there. You can jot some questions down. But if you need to, just, just stop us through. It's pretty important. Um, now, uh, as we talk about what we're going to be presenting today, uh, we'll give you an overview of the mandates themselves and what came out of an executive order specifically on federal contractors, but we're going to talk about the, the whole family of executive orders and, and uh, executive branch decisions that have been impacting this fairly recently over the last three months, uh, but also talk specifically about medical disability pregnancy exemptions, the religious exemptions, and maybe some practice pointers and uh, recommendations as we go through uh, and take your questions as well as we know you're going to have. Now, if I had to summarize that family of things that came out of the Biden administration recently, and when I say recently, although this was clearly discussed in his administration's initial days, really what we've seen in the and recently was a, 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 a large push uh, since September, where two executive orders were signed, uh, both on the 9th of September, um, targeted with effective dates that initially began with uh, federal contractors and I do have a slight error in there. Our federal contractors for this on the effective date after the 9 September signing was actually shifted to 4 January. So those are uh, the first two entries on the table of our, our change. But the impact was to about 4.1 million 
federal contractors. And about equal a number of those, if you look at the line down below, of federal employees, which includes the other side of both uh, civilian employees and active duty military. Those were both done by executive order. The executive order was 14042 for federal contractors and 14043 for federal employees, mandating a vaccine. And that vaccine was fully vaccinated with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that's one dose, Two weeks after that dosage, fully vaccinated, uh, that allows a, a inculcation period of, of two weeks. And for the Moderna and, and uh, Pfizer vaccines, it depended on the vaccine that you were getting, but uh, typically um, uh, initial vaccine separated by potentially four weeks, followed by the second vaccine two weeks after that. Of a target date to be fully vaccinated, initially discussed on the 8th of December, but recently, as we'll talk about some of those challenges on that, has shifted back to the 4th of January. Um, and that 4th of January is for the federal contractors where the employees are still sticking to the 22nd. In addition to that, the administration looked at how they could be able to maximize those vaccinations. And they looked at health workers. Uh, there are about 18 million health workers that are funded under the family of uh, metal, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and federal health providers. That was promulgated by Health and Human Services by an uh, initial, final uh, 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 opinion that was issued um, on the 4th of November. That's also effective on the 4th of January, which not only mandates vaccines, but as an alternative, um, requires testing weekly. Um, and masking requirements, if that's the case. And we'll talk about in detail the federal contractors, but those health workers are anybody that's receiving federal funding to deliver health care. That's 76,000 facilities across the United States. And then lastly, although we're not going to talk about those, those three, the employees and health workers, and most recently the private businesses, over 100 employees, also signed on November Fourth by President Biden, but has now shifted. Initially, it was supposed to be effective on the 4th of January, but because of challenges from several states, um, that impact to 84 million individuals in America uh, that have uh, employment with businesses over 100 people um, was an OSHA requirement. Um, so that occupational uh, safety and uh, health Look to mandate vaccines and testing in the alternative with masks, but also removal from the workplace until the individual tested negative, um, and also provided for paid time off. Those mandates are very different. The more the federal government uh, has control over the workforce member, obviously their workforce control over their own civilian employees and military members is pretty pretty plenary that they have a, a whole lot of extent of breadth and depth of being controlling that. It's a little more difficult when we talk about the 100 employees that are private entities, but I'm going to look at, if we talk about- And Craig, one thing I'm gonna say is if we're gonna have additional time to get in some of the nuts and bolts, we need to keep moving. Sure. We're so already 15 minutes in. There are a whole lot of- Gotta uh, keep the lawyer from talking too much. There's a whole lot of uh, regulations that go along with that, that if you're in the business, you need to be aware of. These slides will be available so that you can actually embrace those and know what those are. But more cited in the middle of that is that yellow pad, that yellow icon in the middle, that's the Safer Federal Workforce Guidance from an appointed task force that lo and behold is not a regulatory entity. There is a significant body of either existing statutes or regulations that if your firm is in this business, that are going to be aware of. Uh, we'll talk about those uh, to a certain extent. Now, if we talk about what is uh, a federal cover, uh, a covered contract with respect to federal contractors in the mandate, um, those are things that are have a clause in it that include IDIQs, OTA schedules, task orders, anything that is greater than the simplified acquisition threshold of $250,000, whether that's for products or whether that's for services or whether that's for a lease. It includes other things that are not quite contracts like credits. But what it also doesn't include are things like grants or product only contracts or those contracts with Indian tribes and those things that are outside the continental United States. And there's a three part phase to that. 
There are contracts that are after the 14th that are clearly must have it in the contract that must include an app award. There are things that are the contract and those like contract instruments from the 15th of October to the 13th of November, 2021, that need to have the addition that must be included in the solicitation that may be included in the embedded contract that's executed in that time frame. And then all those before October 15th, it's not mandatory. So a mandate for those really doesn't happen, isn't effective until the option is exercised or the extension. Now, if you think about- Very quickly, what about subcontracts? So what about the slow down or is that on another slide? Um, those are all included in this. As we'll talk about the prime has responsibility to flow those same clauses. So when I talk about the clause, it's a very simplified clause that basically says all federal contractors must comply with the guidance of the task force. Now, that has to happen simultaneously from primes to subs and from subs to lower tier subs on down the line for the entire, for the entire supply chain of subcontractors, no matter what tier they are. And we've been seeing a number of contract modifications slowing down you know, from prime to subs. Correct. Now, if I have to think about who those are, first off, clearly, those are contractors that are currently on a contract. Think of that as your direct labor. But it also includes workers performing in connection with the contract. Think of your overhead pool. And if I think about what that third function is, this is where it gets really interesting, is workers coming into contact with those workers in the first or second bubbles. And that's typically the GNA pool. But if I have to think about who that actually is, I think about Sam, who's a software developer on contract at a government site. Uh, your security people and your legal folks are overhead pool and GSA and, and GNA. But as we'll talk about, we've also identified some flags that the legal HR and payroll, although the, the uh, GSA had said that they would be in the overhead pool. Clearly, those are typically in the GNA pool for uh, uh, general administrators. Who that actually means, it covers not only the bottom left-hand corner, people on government site, people in your contractor site, but it includes people that are working from home on telecommuting as well. Would this also apply when you talk about subcontractors then? If I subcontract a janitorial service firm to clean up my office space, do I need to then require them to make sure that their employees are? Uh, the difference between subcontractor and vendor is very important. So if that janitorial service is a true subcontractor that is required for, let's say, your machine shop, right? But if you have an office building and they are not directly required of the contract, they're a vendor, not a subcontractor. And therefore, they wouldn't be. However, as a visitor, they would be required to implement masking procedures and social distancing. So where they're not required to have a, your janitorial staff who is a vendor, but your janitorial staff and for Lockheed Martin on the shop floor in a plant is an employee of Lockheed Martin and therefore needs to be vaccinated because that person, even if it's not at the contractor site, could be at the headquarters, needs to be able to have that vaccine. What about the janitor who works from home? Do they have to be vaccinated too? That's um, not if they're working on the contract. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. That's the work on the I mean, What I've seen is that the coverage is going to be almost across the board. And the only exceptions will really be the circumstance where you have true segregation between your employees working on a government contract and your employees perhaps working on a commercial contract, and they don't come into contact at all. They're on in separate buildings. They're in separate states. You know, but if they're working on the same office floor, same office space, they're covered. Right. If they can meet in common areas, yeah, if they, they can, can meet on the them. elevators. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in the family of, of guidance that you'll see, we are focusing on federal contractors this time around. So Executive Order 14042. There are plenty of other guidance that we talked about up front for healthcare workers, for those businesses over 100 for federal employees. In this particular case, the government has wide latitude to require that. Well, I talked about the statutes, but there's significant case law that recognizes governmental authority to, to dictate mandate vaccines in private uh, life, uh, individuals, not just connected with uh, employment. So if you're a federal contractor, the uh, 100 employee threshold is 
is irrelevant. It is because, um, look at it this way as a rule of thumb. Typically, the federal employee executive order is most restrictive because they have the most latitude to work. Second to that is the federal contractors. What is specific guidance by the task force um, is that if two or more of these apply to you, let's say you're over 100 people, you're a federal contractor, and you're a healthcare provider, right? Um, that the federal contractor would apply, uh, not the other requirements. So it, it, it's a rule of thumb when we were advising, and they're all case by case, and we'll see what the primary business area is. But the rule of thumb is the most restrictive. So when we talk about get the shot, there's no other option. You must get the shot. That's typically what you're going to have to default to. Yeah, we have certain clients that are, you know, in both positions, um, and perhaps they have a small government contract running out of their DC office, but have five different offices around the country that's just doing private. They've actually sometimes determined that they're just going to go ahead be covered by the more stringent uh, 14042, just because it's going to be easier for them to implement it across their 400 employees nationwide, other than a testing or you know vaccine mandate. Um, so again, that's the company has the discretion there, um, but they are making that determination. But yeah, you're a federal contract, you're covered, period. Now, some of the issues that I did want to talk about, we'll talk about lightly, because I think the application, many of you are aware of this in the conversations that we've had, the nuances really get into the exceptions and where you get the most risk. So I want to make sure I get to that. Uh, but that that in very adequate safety protocols for federal contractors, which is the formal title of the executive order for federal contractors, is really being governed by the guidance received from the safe federal workforce, which is really has three basic tenets. Everybody is fully vaccinated by the 4th of January. So that you're not confused. There is no stay in this. Although there are legal challenges, it is unlikely that this will be stayed, uh, in my opinion, till the fourth. You've heard some other stays based off of some other guidance that's been passed out for the 100 plus employees, not the same. The second issue, employees follow the CDC protocols in the safe federal workforce guidelines, task force guidance. And then thirdly, the companies need to designate a lead person for compliance. That's very big. Our recommendation is, and we'll talk about that, is having an individual, if not a team, that's dedicated to that, so we can get on it. But some of those other tenants are agencies are encouraged to apply that a non-covered contract. So government agencies are being told by the FAR Council and others to apply this even for non-covered contracts. So even for products only, even for those outside the United States, even for those less than simplified acquisition threshold. And there are class deviations that have been issued on this as well that offer some deviation from the FAR uh, and allow certain things like uh, omitting the 90-day review. There's a presumption of compliance because most of the enforcement, if not all of it, is going to be on us as federal contractors, not the government themselves. Um, I, I, you know, just from what I've heard so far, I imagine um, not too many hands are raised when trying to figure out who wants to be a you know, lead person on compliance. That's uh, what we'll pay for it. Head of HR. Yeah, I would say that doesn't pass the HR. I wouldn't, I wouldn't accept that responsibility lightly. Can I ask a question? Certainly. Uh, right below number three, it says agencies encouraged to apply on non-covered contracts. What does that mean? So non-covered contracts would be those contracts that are below the simplified acquisition threshold for 250000 Right. It would be for Indian tribe contracts. It would be for contracts outside the United States. It would be for products only. So think about commercial items that are products only. I, I need uh, 45,000 widgets for the F-35. Um, or it would be grants. So if you're a grantee, stand by. Your grant is probably going to have that language in it. Because the FAR deviation and others have allowed that, encouraged that. And if you're a... Um, if you're a component acquisition executive, a CAE, you have that authority put into your contracts. In your, it was an interesting point you made. In your opinion, because this is this is now a contractual clause in the contract, the person that's designated lead person for compliance can legally charge to that contract because they're doing it as a stipulation of the contract. Would that be uh, correct? So there's probably a number of different ways that you could charge that individual. And I, and I think we'll circle back on that 
um, a little bit later. Uh, you might want to set it up as, a, as an indirect cost element. It could be direct. Um, depends on how many contracts you have, how widespread this is. Um, but that, that's an excellent question. And Chris, let me get um, uh, John's question real quick. What we've been being told by our contracting officer, so bef before I came with uh, with uh, Merritt and I was doing business development for Lockheed Martin, heavily involved with a lot of other contracting officers in the program development side, but informally they were telling us, we don't want you to invoice off of this. We need you to do an equitable adjustment or another cost recovery mechanism that, uh, that really exceeds the scope of what we have in the short time that we have left, but and we'll probably do another just focused on equitable adjustments for this. Um, but so that that is the mechanism to do it out, off, outside of the invoice. Chris? Just a quick question. Uh, thank you. Anything, uh, any directive regarding auditing? There's what? not been, but then I default back. So this covers non FAR oriented contracts, things like uh, other transactional agreements, OTAs, and other things that aren't quite contracts, but are like contracts. We would apply that same contract language in you know, any modification for the FAR, which is the majority of these, it's FAR Part 43 contract modifications. And we'd go through the litany of the eight part side of what we would do for that. So even though no, it's silent, that doesn't mean that the federal government has well anticipated this with you know, 250 years of proud acquisitions experience. Okay. Um, next, um, so let's talk about what some of those things are when we talk about what you happens when you fail on those issues and compliance issues. Uh, this looks at contractors' adherence to the task force guidance, even if they are subject, your question, or something else, like the OSHA uh, uh, emergency uh, interim uh, or that had been uh, issued for the 100 plus employees for the federal uh, health care workers. <clears throat> Contractor employee refusals, though. The government gave some, unlike some of the cost issue, gave some suggestions on the way they handle it. This is great when you hear the government talk about suggestions on how well you handle it. It's, it's not something you take to the bank, but it's pretty good guidance of what they would do. First, they'd encourage, educate, and counsel. Then they discipline. Then the government may deny entry to a federal workplace. Not a hard to invoice off of that if you can't get to the place. And finally, only then, which the government is being fairly pragmatic, you heard a lot of draconian things, removal after continued non-compliance. So they're not gonna kick you out the first day. Early and continued conversation with the contracting officer, the contracting officer, the technical representatives is fundamental to making sure that you don't wind up on the bad side of this. Just <laughs> Harassment first, then some light, try to be discipline. Arm twisting. Yeah, arm twisting, a little shaming, do some peer pressure. Now, I told you that the prime contracts are responsible for first tier contractors to make the same contract flow downs. If you're going to do that as a practice pointer, articulate in there, do a solid for your subs and tell them there's an equitable adjustment. Now, you would see the equitable adjustment that you're given from the government contractor. And if you're a sub, make sure that language is in there and don't let the prime weasel out of that because that's probably going to be in their flow down clauses from the FAR that they probably didn't give you in your subcontract flow downs. And unless it's in there, and unless you talk about it, the government's going to look like, and your prime's going to look at like it. You're kind of weak. But you got 60 days to be able to look at those issues when it comes down to an equitable, an equitable adjustment when you've incurred the cost. And if you don't, just the cost goodbye. Mask required is an, is an item of that on compliance, either in a higher sustainable risk, even if you're vaccinated. And they're absolutely required for any exemptions that we'll talk about for those people that oh, I do have exemptions. And I, real quick on this, you've all probably heard in the news that there is either lawsuits in the federal courts by the states, or there are legislation in the states to try to govern what's happening in their state when it comes to these federal contractors. Very quickly, the first one was Arizona on the 22nd of October, which is actually an amended complaint. It goes over some different theories. The second one, because everybody loves Florida man has come to come from Florida. Uh, and then on the 29th, a whole bunch of states, the 10 joint, the seven joint, and Texas, because they're different, all filed on the 29th of October to be able to talk about the grounds that we look at. Those grounds at the top are things like uh, overreach, um, uh, you know, usurpation of the state. So those are happening, but until it changes, 
So our guidance on the 100 person plus has been stayed with TBD. None of this has been a stay in the federal contractor side, nor do I anticipate it happening. And what's impressive is I think Craig read through all of these complaints, which I, I for one, say I have not yet, and probably don't plan on it. So far. <laughs> Uh, I get to geek out on that. That's actually uh, not a joke. Actually, let's have a lot of fun doing that. So um, now, let me. You need a hug. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. Um, now, more important to your business, particularly if you're like some of our clients that perform space issues in Alabama or in Florida, right? Those legislation that or executive orders from the governors that are actually trying to show up a barrier. Executive orders aren't really putting up real barriers. It's not until we get down to the different states and we're talking Iowa, Arkansas, Florida, it's Tennessee that's actually going after potentially those federal contractors that must be in compliance or will lose their livelihoods and have to let go their people because they'll lose government contracts that are really looking at legal remedies against contractors for doing things like asking for their status, making them get the vaccine, not allowing them to use alternatives like proof that they've already had. Now with that, I'm gonna transfer this over because that kind of takes me my overview unless there are other questions on that. Our, my final guidance just on one thing, the states comply with the federal government if you own a federal government contract. If you're a subcontractor, comply. Have a conversation with your employees and that just to make sure you're at least have the flag to show I've had to comply if you ever have to go in front of the state board and justify what that might be. Good. Um, and I'm going to try to go through this relatively quickly once so we have time for cost accounting and insurance issues, uh, questions. And I also imagine in the past month, all of you have probably read about, heard about some of the religious exemptions and some of these other issues. So I'll go through it, but ask any questions that you might have. Um, as I've said to one or two of you, I've spent a lot of the last month working with contractors, putting together their policies, and then reviewing, you know, hundreds of requests for exemptions that employees have provided. Um, so, if you have any questions in that regard? So, grounds for exemption. So, medical or disability, um, it, it's tough in that regard. CDC has not identified any specific medical condition. You know, in fact, a lot of times, folks with the disability, the uh, indication the recommendation is to get the vaccine from doctors. Um, so, you know, there are instances where individuals might have an allergic reaction, um, but as you would with any request for a medical exemption, you take it, you review it, you look at the doctor's notes, you, you give it uh, consideration in that regard um, you know, to determine whether or not it's something that should be, uh, the exemption should be allowed. Um, How do you make that decision? You know, you have something else? You say that's the lead designee, designee right? It's a big, big well, a lot of times it's you know, put together a team. So a lot of our the employers, uh, contractors are working with, it's the head of HR, maybe it's a senior executive, and perhaps they want legal counsel. If no other else, they have someone to blame. You know, and hopefully some good legal advice. Um, so, and we as a team will go through things and, and make a decision. You know, a lot of times it's, uh, especially once we get the forms in good shape, it's going through it and if they're providing a good faith uh, grounds for the exemption, a lot of what we're reviewing are the religious ones. Um, and it comports, a lot of times we'll talk to the supervisor and say, you know, does this, you know, make sense? Um, we're not going to do much more of an analysis than that because it's the employer should not be. Um, should should the employer start talking to their insurance companies? You know, if they haven't been, or I'm surprised. You know, one thing that I want to talk about is there are the insurance companies reaching out, providing guidance, uh, especially if there's uh, employment practices liability insurance. My understanding is not too much. No, no, not yet. Uh, insurance companies are always reactive, right? We're still trying to figure out how to carve out coverage or exclude coverage for liability for drones and COVID itself. Um, but as far as you know, passing um, you know, 
responsibility, the liability and all that. But it definitely can't hurt to advise your insurance carrier on situations that could get rise, right? Like, like a uh, employee or a group of employees claiming, you know, exemption because of religious beliefs. The sooner you get us involved, the sooner we get approval from merit to get in there and really start creating, making bigger moves in terms of, of kind of leading that foregoing um, a headway. Well, at what point do you determine it's a claim that you should well, provide notice? Right. So, you know, 100 employee government contractor probably has, you know, five to 10 employees requesting exemptions. Uh, employer goes through, does a good faith analysis. Maybe of those five, determines that one of them perhaps does not qualify, you know, and tells that person that. Or like a more likely scenario might be like you have 20 that suddenly apply for religious uh, exemptions uh, because they're, uh, you know, whatever. But they previously did not actually demonstrate that any proclivity to uh, practicing that religion. Um, now you have a situation where you're about to tell people that they're not apply. Um, you know, the insurance carrier can't really help advise on how to approach that, um, but we can also help the insurance uh, policy prepare to have the appropriate response for worst case. Yeah, like right. making sure you know general counsel is the representation of the legal representation on the policy. And, and in that scenario, the counsel that we've been providing and working with employers says they make those decisions very carefully. You know, and denying an exemption, you should be pretty confident that um, there's reason to die. And we'll go into that a little bit more as we go along. Um, the other ground that we've been seeing is pregnancy. Um, and again, although- uh, You're not pregnant. Yeah, so most doctors have recommended pregnant women to get vaccinated. It's still something that a number of uh, pregnant women, we had an attorney working for us, she did not get vaccinated while pregnant, you know. Um, her doctor said, you know, that's that's your prerogative. We did not have any sort of mandate. Uh, we're not a government contractor at Clark's Ball. Um, but, you know, it is something that's happening. If, uh, you know, if someone comes forth with that uh, request for an exemption, if they have a note from a doctor on review it, you know, probably provide that exemption. Um, then we go into what really everyone's been dealing with is the what is the sincerely held religious belief? So this is under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act 1964. Um, what's made this so interesting is in the past, you know, 50 years that we've been dealing with religious exemption issues, it really hasn't come up that much, except, you know, a lot of the Supreme Court cases are dealing with working on a Saturday or Sunday, you know, or a certain dress that you might have to wear or not wear at a, at a business. This is the first time it's come up in sort of a widespread basis. Um, so, you know, just from an academic uh, perspective, it's very interesting. So, but you can read this just as well as I can. You know, it is not just, you know, Christians or established religion, but it's a sincerely held religious, ethical, and moral belief. You know, ultimate ideas on life, purpose, or death. You know, it does not include social, political, economic philosophies, personal preferences. You know, I believe in living a healthy, you know, lifestyle where I don't put any chemicals into my body. You know, that's where it does not uh, cover. Distress of the vaccine is not a religious belief. So you'll see a lot of requests that, that perhaps start off religious, but then they go off on a page or two about the vaccine and how the vaccine can change your body's DNA. And they talked about different scientists who have come forward with, you know, these studies. And um, you know, that if it goes into that as a scientific reason, as opposed to a religious reason, you know, it sometimes brings into question whether it is a sincerely held religious belief for that person. Um, for employers, you want to establish objective criteria you're looking at it on a case by case basis, you know, and you should have at least two or three people looking at all of these, um, just so it is, you have a few people looking at it. It is a team and it's not just one person who you could say that person's biased or something. Um, you just have to be very careful in that regard. Um, 
the employers are permitted to make a limited inquiry into the facts and circumstances. So if you've seen um, the government has uh, put out their questionnaires for employees and it, you know normally it's five or six questions you know please provide a statement of your religious belief please uh, provide an analysis or a statement of why you think this uh, taking the vaccine uh, impacts that belief please explain how historically you have acted in that regard um, you know, and if you don't, if you've taken other vaccines, explain why you don't want to take this vaccine. You know, why is this different? Um, other employers, uh, you know, one of the big issues is um, fetal cells and research of these vaccines. And a number of employers have put out questionnaires saying, okay, if you're objecting to this vaccine, do you take Tylenol and other medicines, tubs? You know, and are you aware that fetal cell research was utilized in developing those drugs also? And a lot of times people had no idea. And in fact, I didn't really understand the extent that the fetal cell lines were used in modern medicine research until getting in all of this. Um, and there's none currently fetal cell directly translated to the vaccines that are in right now. But some of the precursor work that they had done that was by extension, yes, they did. But so in that regard, someone comes forward and just says, yep, question. Hey, just a quick question. I mean, uh, jump in there mid sentence, but um, is there a difference between the word exemption and accommodation? Yes. In this mandate? And, and the, reason we'll get why, the reason why I ask is uh, dealing with uh, a uh, religious um, accommodation mm -hmm. or a uniform that we're right now. So I understand that, you know, in the military sense. So what's the difference here in this context? So we'll go into that in about two slides. Okay. But you think about it this way. You first have to have the exemption. You have the sincerely held religious belief. That then puts you in a protected class. Then from there, you need to determine, is there a reasonable accommodation that can be provided that allows the employee to do the job? You know? Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. So it's step one, one, step two. First, it's a given. My read on a uniform member requesting this is that the uh, you know the commanding officer really doesn't at all address the exemption question at all and is asked to address the accommodation mm -hmm. side of it entirely. I think that's a lot out of ignorance that we don't do that. Um, and there's been an uptick in insurance for professional liability for government civilian supervisors that have realized that they didn't have the coverage in applying this very question of both the exemption and the accommodation. And I think to Merit's point is that it's the exemption that we, that people really don't understand that we're able to ask some questions, but it's really the accommodation that really puts the employer in a driver's seat that we, you know, from, from what that reasonable extent is. So. Yeah, and again, what makes this so difficult is historically someone came and requested a religious accommodation. You know, I don't want to work on a Saturday because it's my Sabbath. I work on a Sunday. I don't want to wear, you know, a certain uniform. Um, it was a pretty easy initial burden. Do you have a religious belief? And the employer didn't really do an analysis into that. And the EEOC guidance on that was you shouldn't really do analysis into whether or not they have a religious belief. The analysis was more, what is the accommodation once you have it? But now for the first time, the EEOC has provided guidance that you can perhaps should look into it a little bit. Um, you know, and, and here's what some of the things that they've said that you can do. So is the behavior inconsistent with the professed belief? So nine months ago, were they just going around, you know, holding, you know, anti-vax signs and saying that the vaccine is, you know, just a political ploy, you know, and not saying anything. You know, did they just all of a sudden find God when never before were they religious in any manner, you know, and acted in a manner contrary to it? I yeah. just say, because I know the insurance, I know like interject in some, some, some um, circumstances where this is going to really create issues from the employment practices sector. Not it's encouraging employees to basically like find ways to protect yourselves. If you don't have any yet, Go ahead and get some now, right? So that you can then protect yourself from the, what happens next. So 
see some serious discrimination issues coming up, both in terms of like, you know, how the employer is supposed to really um, investigate and, and, and make determinations on something like whether or not someone's fairly practicing. Like it, it's a lot of interpretation for, but, you know, I mean, I'm not speaking specifically to vaccine. I'm talking about what you know, what can kind of come from these discussions. That come from. Okay. You know, not just just for the question, and not to open a can of worms, but timing question in and of itself is that discriminatory. Someone finds God today, right, and then all of a sudden files an exemption. It, it really depends on some of the circumstances. So there was a, a federal case out of Pennsylvania where a student. Uh, didn't want to get the vaccine as a requirement for university students. Um, and he said he didn't want to do it for religious purposes. Um, and it was because the fetal cell lines were utilized uh, for the COVID vaccines. Well, apparently two years ago, he had gotten a vaccine um, and knew that fetal cell lines were used at the time. So the ruling was you knew about the fetal cell lines, you didn't make the request for or your religious exemption before, you can't now just do it for COVID. Um, you knew about it, you didn't do it, but you can just find that. And EO sometimes does say, just because you didn't believe in something a year ago, doesn't mean that you can't now, which is again, why this is difficult. Um, and it's sort of, you throw it all into uh, you know, the analysis and look at all the factors. And what we've been doing is the, the benefit is finding a sincere religious belief someone comes forward, unless you have a clear reason not to. Because again, an employer doesn't really want to be the arbiter of someone's religious belief. You know, and especially you don't want to take on that potential liability. Is there anybody you can outsource this to? You know, a law firm. Yeah. All right. So I mean, we're, 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 that's what we do. Um, and this is what we were just talking about. You know, EEO compliance manual provides that none of these factors is positive. You know, prior and consistent contact is relevant, but it's not, you know, the end all be all. So again, it really is just on a case by case basis going through all this. So step two, you've determined that someone has a uh, sincerely held religious belief. You have to determine whether there's a direct threat. You know, so significant risk of substantial harm that cannot be eliminated or reduced by a reasonable accommodation. So that's again, so we go into this reasonable medical judgment that relies on most current knowledge. So again, you look through these factors, determine that it is a direct threat. Guidance from the EOC and others have said COVID is a direct threat. So then you need to look to see, um, and I'm gonna jump through this because again, you can look at each workplace. Is the person working remotely? Then you're gonna have less of a direct threat because they're not interacting with other folks. Are they in a you know, secure facility where you know, you're not wearing masks because you need to communicate? You might have a different standard there. Um, right, you did have a question. Nope. Yes. Um, I'm looking at this year down the line. And so next year, I have to get a booster vaccine because it only lasts for so long. How did that get affected by this? So the question was, if we got that, I got that. Yep. I'm good. Not really. Because a year from now, they say, well, you really need to be back to get me vaccinated because it only lasts for so long. Does that mean I have to have in these clauses that everybody has to get me vaccinated? And then I'll ask the next question who vaccinated? So why isn't this the same thing? Um, I, mean, I think there are a few answers there. So the first question was on the booster. Are you gonna be required to get the booster as of the law stands right now? Absolutely not. The law is and it's standard, you know, you have your first Johnson and Johnson, you have your two regiments of the others. That's all the law provides now. Could they modify in the future? Perhaps, I don't know. Probably depends on what the status is of the pandemic and whether or not you know, as many people are still getting sick and dying. Um, so I don't have a crystal ball. Hopefully the answer is no, it will not be relevant. As for flu, you know, it wasn't killing as many people, 
you know, and that was in the heart of the, the pandemic. You know, it wasn't the public health emergency. Quite a number. Yeah. So it does. You're right. That's, oh, absolutely. Which is one reason why this is such a political hot ball of a topic, and I stay out of all the politics uh, as much as I possibly can. Um, so direct threat analysis is you know part of what you need to do. Um, depends on the workplace, and then. You go to the reasonable accommodation that we talked about. So, so someone tries to do this thing, and you find out it's pretty abstract. What do you do next? You train or educate them, and then if they don't want to be educated, are they have to then be fired? Well, this is a condition of employment, you know. So if um, you know, they're requesting an exemption from uh, a condition of employment. You know, it's just like for a job of an engineer, you need to have a certain, you know, qualifications. You don't have those qualifications, you're going to be fired. You know, same thing here. This is a job qualification, you need it, you're fired. All the time we have employers sign, employees sign, ninth compete non-solicitation agreements. It's a condition of employment. You don't sign it, you're fired. You know, it's at will employment. Same, same circumstances. And I got it for This doesn't cover private businesses. It does now, but is the lawsuit that was just. Well, that's the hundred employees, yeah. you know, and that will be you know, you're either vaccinated or you're getting tested. And for so now, that's in that part of the system, vaccination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That'll be consideration. Yeah, and in that circumstance, though, right now, the employee, uh, by the law, um, uh, the employer does not have to pay for the test. But again, that's outside the scope of what we're talking about today. Um, reasonable accommodation. I don't know how many of you have dealt with sort of reasonable accommodations and employment relationships in the past, just dealing with, you know, disabilities and doing accommodations, you know, but it is, you, know, you look to see, you know, well, two things. One, under Title VII, religious uh, discrimination, religious exemption, it is a lesser standard than what you might have dealt with under the Americans with Disabilities Act for disability. So it is more than a minimal cost or burden on the employer. So it's a less strand, uh, stringent uh, test. And the factors look at the type of workplace, nature of the duties, identifiable cost, number of employees, uh, and the like. So what I think a lot of government contractors are struggling with is what does it mean when you've had employees for the last 12 months either working remotely or wearing a mask and getting tested and going into the workplace? That really seems like it could be a reasonable accommodation. But we're getting guidance from some federal workplaces that you're going to need to be vaccinated or not allowed in the federal workplace. Um, so I think we're still waiting to get more guidance from some of the federal clients in that regard. You know, and, and Gray, I don't know if you have anything to sort of add, sort of what our clients have been hearing from uh, federal contracts, uh, their, their you know, contracting officers. Um, it, it, right now, a month ago, two months ago, definitely, there was much more of a straight bet. The pushback has given the, the acquisitions workforce in, in the, the government a chance to reevaluate and says, okay, wait, we're not going to ask you the first week. Right? We're going to work with you. But come and tell us what your costs are. Let's have a dialogue about it. Let's plan on this. It's a much more give and take issue than we first heard when this came out. But make no mistake, um, there's going to be uh, examples of made of companies, uh, of contracts and other things, because this is important to the health of our supply chain for our national security. So there, there's there's accommodations being made and, and flexibility, but they're driving to a goal. Patrick, did you have something to add there? No, I was just giving you the one minute so, so oh. the accountants can talk about it. That's all. Absolutely. I'm trying to keep pushing. Um, we've all, I think we've already talked about accommodation. You know, really, it's just looking at the circumstances. You know, the, what the EEOC is provided here um, it may not hold true for all government workplaces. So. Someone's going to have to be getting guidance in that regard. Um, recommendations, best practices. 
again, it's documentation, it's documentation, it's documentation, it's going through the process. Um, and that, you know, cost confidence, and then I need to go and right click and make sure I can see here. So, uh, one question for uh, Greg, and we can shift over to uh, cost patients. Um, if, say, uh, a leader of an agency or part of an agency lawfully decides or makes the decision, Nobody's coming into this facility that I control unless they're vaccinated. How then could someone uh, with, the, with the religious exemption be reasonably accommodated and perform the duties in that facility? Here's the rub if, if it's really a let's say the director of your agency makes that decision. Um, the issue is not about granting the, the uh, uh, exemption, it's all about the accommodation. And the courts are, are extremely favorable to agency decisions the way they think they should run their agency. So if you make that decision, and let's say a visitor can't come in, but they're essentially to win a contract and they didn't win the contract, they will not have a recourse for protest. At least they won't be successful. So I, I look at that as kind of an issue on the short shift. Uh, catch me later, I'll, I'll give you all the on that. Sure. Uh, and again, that's. My, my personal opinion yet with just doing the cursory thing, I don't know. No, no, guys, this was great. Uh, you guys did a wonderful job. As lawyers, you talk long and a lot um, and left the accountants five minutes, but that's okay. Um, you know, four minutes more than insurance. Guys. Four minutes more than the insurance. Guys. Well, done, sir. well done. All right. So, so what you should be doing today from an accounting standpoint, and you know, you should be identifying all those costs that you potentially incur. Um, as a result of having to react to the situation. Um, and, and you have to take sort of that overarching position that I'm gonna do everything in my policy so that I get reimbursed for every single dollar that I have to spend on this mandate. Um, the government didn't give you any guidance on how to do that. Um, nobody said, here are the additional costs you're going to incur. They simply said, you have to enforce these rules. And there are costs associated with that. You don't know exactly what they are. You can't estimate those costs today. Um, and they didn't tell you how to ask for reimbursement. They didn't tell you whether they would reimburse you. So at this point, you're in a position of you have to make up a way forward for yourself. Um, you have to set policies, you have to set procedures, and you need to basically go forth on that path and do that until somebody tells you you're wrong. Um, so, so what I would say is, um, you know, so insert policies that's going to allow you to recover all the costs. Um, next, and, and Craig talked about this, um, if you're a prime contractor, um, you should be concerned about your subcontractors passing cost up to you that you can't invoice to the government. So, you know, if there's a way to modify those clauses or modify your contracts and, and somehow say to the, to the sub, look, don't invoice this to me, and maybe you put that in the contract to ask on a little bit. And I assume that has to be bilateral. And then maybe they'll agree, maybe they won't. And all the modifications right now, you haven't already gotten them. All of them are bilateral at this point. Okay, so so you're, you're negotiating with your sub. You're saying, look, you're going to incur these additional costs. We don't know what they are. Don't invoice them. And, and you know, set them aside, and we'll try to do a request for equity. Right. Right? Right. Okay. All right, so that, that's important. Um, now, if you're a sub, you know, it's very important to you to talk to your primes and say, I'm going to invoice you every, for every single dollar that I have. You, you have an adverse relationship, right? I want to be able to send those costs to you and you deal with them. Um, you know, you have privity with the federal government. I do not. Um, but so it's kind of your deal. Here's the additional costs you're going to incur on your contract as a result of this rule you're passing down to me. Um, so you, you kind of have to weigh that. And, and Craig is trying to sit on both sides of that. I'm of the opinion, you know, you do what's best for your own organization. 